The only comment I'd make to the Conrad Chairman is that I hope that it isn't to be taken that what I am about to say reflects a non-Marxist position in contrast to what uh, Conrad Lynn Walsh would be saying. Differing Marxist positions, perhaps. I think it's very important when considering the question of Chile and the question of the lessons to be learned from the experience of the popular and revolutionary movement in Chile to decide what it is that really went on there, what happened in 1973, and what is still going on in Chile today. And the first thing that it's very important to stress is that the Chilean revolution has not finished. Events in Chile did not suddenly come to a halt in September 1973, leaving a sort of vacuum after them and a sort of past tense series of events which we can go and analyse and sort of pull out of the deep freeze and chop up into pieces and look at. History is not like that. The Marxist perception of history is certainly not like that. And events since September 1973 in Chile certainly don't justify any such view of events. And I'm sure that nobody in this room anyway would suggest that they did. Clearly, there is still a popular movement in Chile. There is still a strong resistance movement to the military junta. And clearly, revolution and ultimately socialism in Chile are very much on the agenda for the Chilean working class and its allies. The second thing that I think it's important to stress <coughs> is that in learning the lessons of any historical experience, it is important to learn not only from errors and mistakes, but also from successes. And I think one of the great difficulties in analysing a series of events such as those in Chile, which led to a significant defeat and setback for the Chilean working class, is a temptation to look only on the negative side. And if we succumb to that temptation, then we would in fact ignore many important lessons to be learned from successes of the Chilean working class, in particular during the three years of the popular unity government. <coughs> Communists from parties throughout the world have looked at and analysed the situation and experience of popular unity in Chile. And they have done so not uncritically. And you will find, if you're willing to read communist publications, very detailed and thorough criticisms and considerations of events in Chile. And I think that one of the most impressive facets of that process of analysis has been the analysis made by the Chilean Communist Party itself. And if anyone is interested in knowing their opinion and their analysis, there are two particular documents that I draw your attention to. The first is a publication of August 1977 of the plenary committee, uh, of the plenary of the Central Committee of the Chilean Communist Party, which produced a document called The Chilean Revolution, the Fascist Dictatorship, and the Struggle to Overthrow it, throw it and Create a New Democracy. And that document contains a very substantial section of about 30 pages with a very thorough self-criticism and look at the whole popular unity period. In greater detail, separate events are, and separate aspects of the Chilean revolutionary process have been published in World Marxist Review in separate articles over a period of about two to three years and brought together in a single volume uh, called 1,000 Days of Revolution, CP Chile Leaders on Lessons of the Events in Chile. So if you are interested to know in much more detail than I can possibly go into, the documents exist and are relatively easily obtainable. <coughs> Q. 
Chile and the popular unity victory in 1970 in the elections that brought Salvador Allende to the presidency proved the possibility of the working class and the people of a country such as Chile obtaining a portion of state power by non-armed means and carrying out a series of revolutionary transformations with a view to laying the basis from which to proceed to socialism. That formulation that I've just given is one that is given in varying forms by different communist parties, including the Chilean one itself, and is a very careful formulation that I'd like you to think very seriously about. In particular, the part that says obtaining a portion of state power by non-armed means. And I draw your attention to the fact that it does not say obtaining state power, the whole of state power, and it does not say by electoral or parliamentary means. It merely says non-armed means. And those particular formulations, which you might or might not agree with, are nevertheless very important. This was the first experience, I think perhaps in the world, of any significant duration of the peaceful development of a revolution. <coughs> Suppose that next year or sometime, the government came to power in Britain, which nationalised North Sea oil and all British mineral resources, that nationalised or completed the nationalisation of Shell, BP, ICI, Unilever, GEC, Tube Investments, IMI, Metalbox, Tate & Lyle, the Rank Organisation, British Oxygen, Lunro, and a list of some 70, 80 of the largest companies in Britain. Supposing that this government nationalised NatWest, Lloyds, Barclays, Williams and Glynn's, and the great majority of the clearing and merchant banks of the City of London. Supposing that this government took over and expropriated the landed estates of the British aristocracy and of all the large land holdings, many of them now in the hands of the corporations throughout the country. Supposing that the participation of wage earners in the gross domestic income of Britain were raised from whatever it is now but to, let's say, from 55%, as it was in Chile, to 68%. Supposing that the industrial decline of Britain were halted and in the course of two years, industrial production were raised by 20%. Suppose that unemployment was slashed from its present level to below 3%. Supposing that free milk, which has been cut back for school children, were extended until 20 million children had free milk and, let's say, free school meals also. Supposing that 40 million school textbooks were distributed free in schools, that 12,500 special uni university scholarships for workers were instituted, that instead of hospitals being closed and all kinds of special facilities under the National Health Service cut off as they are being today, the hospital service were greatly expanded and a system of 1,100 special clinics instituted in working class and poorer areas of the towns and countryside. <coughs> Supposing that the national insurance and pension scheme were extended to three million people who had never had it before. Supposing that the largest 
publisher, I don't know what the largest publisher is, let's say Macmillan, were nationalized and produced in the course of two years 60 million cheap popular books for distribution to all who wanted. And supposing that far from housing being slashed, as it is at present by this government, instead of council houses being sold, the number of housing starts were raised dramatically by 10 to 15 percent. If such a government could come to power in Britain next year, and if it instituted those measures, I think there would be very little doubt in the minds of any of us that those measures were of revolutionary scope and importance to all working people in Britain. And very crudely translated, because of course you cannot make simplistic parallels, that is about the size of the achievements of the Popular Unity Government for the people of Chile. I've multiplied the figures up because of course Britain is a country with approximately five times the population of Chile. And they don't really give you a sense of the scale of the changes instituted by popular unity in Chile. Because Chile is a country incomparably more backward, with greater poverty, with less services of all kinds to the great majority of the people. Nevertheless, that gives a very rough idea of the achievement. And those achievements are a merit and a, an important source of lessons for us and for people throughout the world which cannot be thrown away and destroyed. And in fact, the more the fascist junta in Chile attempts to reverse all of those positive changes, the greater the strength of the example set by popular unity and the greater the impact on the consciousness great majority of the Chilean people. Another aspect, and it's a rather paradoxical aspect of the Chilean experience, one that was not implicit in the experience itself but in what happened afterwards, is the strength of the solidarity movement and the kinds of feeling that it is aroused in progressive people and democratic people throughout the world. And it may be rather strange to attribute this as a merit of the Chilean revolution, but I think nevertheless it is a measure of the merit of that revolution that possibly only two other struggles in the last 20, 30 years have aroused the kind of level of mass activity, consciousness, and progressive solidarity in the world, as has Chile. And those other two examples are Vietnam and Southern Africa. And I think what is very interesting to note is that each in its way, Chile, Vietnam, and the struggle in Southern Africa, typify a different kind of struggle and a different kind of revolutionary possibility and uh, course followed under very different circumstances by different people. Self-evidently, the struggle in Vietnam was a struggle against a foreign colonial invader <coughs> and oppressor, the United States. It was a military struggle, nevertheless waged with a high degree of political mass <coughs> participation and mobilization. <coughs> and it was ultimately successful. And it was supremely important because it demonstrated to the world, to people struggling for national independence and freedom everywhere, that US imperialism was not invincible even in the military field. And I think that that is a lesson that has been taken aboard by peoples everywhere and has been an enormous source of strength and importance to them. In Southern Africa, we have the concluding stages of the national liberation struggle of the African peoples against, in particular, the oppressive apartheid regime of Southern Africa. A struggle that is also an armed struggle, 
and a struggle that is being waged with increasing intensity and attra attract solidarity from all of us. And in Chile, we had a different struggle, which was a non-armed struggle of a people that succeeded, apparently against the odds, in obtaining a part of state power at elections by non-armed means and carrying forward a series of revolutionary transformations. That people, of course, encountered enormous difficulties. The first was the battle of US imperialism and its right-wing allies in Chile to prevent popular unity from ever assuming power in the first place. That battle was carried out before the elections in 1970 and with great intensity between the date of the election victory and the date when Allende was confirmed as president by Congress. And it was a battle that failed. Secondly, there was the difficulty of the fact that in Chile, even despite the election victory, popular unity had power only over the presidency and the executive and did not have power or control over the judiciary, over the organization called the Controleria, Controleria which is concerned with <coughs> implementing and uh, analyzing legislation and basically performed the service that a lot of the civil service does here. And thirdly, although the president was nominally commander-in-chief of the armed forces, popular unity had only very partial control over the armed forces and the police. External factors of enormous weight and importance dictated events in Chile to a very great degree. And I'm not going to go in in great detail to the activities of the CIA, to the question of ITT and other multinationals, to the credit boycott, to the activities of the IMF and the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, and so forth. I think everybody here already knows the kind of external blockade and boycott that was imposed upon popular unity at the dictate of the United States imperialism. I just want to give a couple of very simple examples to give an idea of the scale of dependency. In Chile, the great majority of lorries and buses were forged. When Popular Unity assumed the government in November 1970, Ford immediately closed down its plant, an assembly plant in Chile, and withdrew all credit facilities for the supply of spare parts, let alone new vehicles. They also exercised their influence over Ford dealers throughout the rest of Latin America and the world in an attempt to prevent any spares <coughs> reaching Chile by other routes. A single fact alone, over which popular unity had no control whatsoever, was sufficient to create astronomic difficulties <coughs> of a practical nature in carrying forward the government and the tasks of uh, construction and production. A second example. I worked in Chile as a computer programmer. And I worked for a government institute and I used to go regularly to the Chilean government computer centre. The computers there were all IBM. They'd been bought and installed by a previous government. IBM's head office in Chile was just round the corner. All computing that was actually done by the Chilean government and its various ministries and departments was done at this computer centre. And that included all sorts of figures concerning the Chilean economy and so forth. I don't actually know for a fact, but it seems to me almost certain that IBM, acting on behalf of the American government, did, as it certainly had the technical possibility to do, pass to its masters copies of all the important 
relevant economic documents concerning government and the economy of Chile during the popular unity period. The final major difficulty that I want to mention was differences between, within the popular unity alliance and the difficulty in reaching common agreement as particularly at moments of crisis and as things became more difficult towards the middle of 1972. <coughs> the fundamental problem, and a problem that is fundamental to our appreciation of lessons to be learned from the Chilean experience, was the problem of alliances. The victory in 1970 at the elections, and even more so, the fact that the majority in Congress then voted to, that Allende should become president, and that subsequently almost the whole of the Chilean Congress voted through the nationalization of the copper. These positive developments meant the separation from the oligarchy, the grand bourgeoisie, the sectors immediately allied to imperialism, and the traditional land-earning aristocracy in Chile. The separation from those pro-imperialist sectors of vast middle sectors of the population. And those sectors became grouped around the working class, which was the head and major moving force within popular unity itself and in the government, its program and its actual project. Throughout the three years of popular unity, the fundamental struggle that was going on between right and left, between progressive and reactionary, between imperialism and between the Chilean people, was the struggle to change the terms of that alliance and to change the balance of forces that had made it possible for that alliance to obtain a portion of the state power. And in turn, the battle being waged by popular unity was to increase the scope of that alliance and to consolidate it by taking control of further sectors of state power and in particular by resolving critical problems concerned with the judiciary and the armed forces and the opposition majority in Congress which blocked all legislation that popular unity attempted to pass. The Chilean Communist Party has been extremely frank in analysing the military problem. And it has said quite clearly that in retrospect it is clear that they, as a Communist Party, that the progressive movement in Chile as a whole should have been working within the armed forces, not merely from the word go in 1970, but ever since they formulated the basic strategy that led to the popular unity victory in 1970, which was back in the mid-50s. And in fact, even further back was the first time that Allende stood for president at the head of a popular coalition in 1952. They should have been working in three ways. First of all, to know and understand the armed forces, how they actually worked, and so forth. Secondly, to work to have influence over them and to link the armed forces with the people in a way that every attempt to use the armed forces as an institution by reaction attempts to sever the links between members of the armed forces and the people. And thirdly, to work publicly for the democratization of the armed forces and for democratic controls to be imposed over them in such a way as to make <coughs> seditious activity impossible. None of these things obviously are easy, but basically what they say with regard to this problem is that the work was not done. And it not only was not done during the three years of popular unity, but it had not been done since long before. 
our party in analyzing events in Chile, and that analysis was published very rapidly after the coup in a pamphlet by Jack Wallace. Singled out a number of areas as ones of key importance. The first, the problem of the state. The fact that the socialist state requires a socialist state machine, but that a non-armed road to take over control of an existing bourgeois state and transform it into a state at the service of socialism requires democratic struggle to transform the state dating back from long before the actual assumption of power portion of power by, by the popular forces. The question of the army we examine in a very similar way to the Chilean party and stress the vital need for the movement in Britain from now to be campaigning for the democratization of the armed forces, for the disbandment of paramilitary police groupings such as the SPG, for full democratic rights for members of the police and armed forces to belong to political parties, to take part in political activity and to vote, to belong to trade unions and for the right of their trade unions to affiliate to the TUC. A third aspect we look at with particular concern is the media, because if in Chile the left was poor and weak, in terms of its access to and control over the media. In Britain, we are infinitely poorer and weaker. There is possibly no country in the world, it seems to me, with as low a readership of progressive or left daily newspapers, or even weekly newspapers, as Great Britain. And that is a matter of profound concern for us all. Fourthly, the role and power of the multinational corporations, different for a country like Britain, the situation of Chile, where our dependency is less, but not unimportant. Fifthly, the key question of mass action. Often, characterization of our policy as a British government or of other communist parties stress on a non-armed road to socialism. Assume the role of caricatures and ignore what we consider to be absolutely fun fundamental. And that is not only parliamentary struggle, but extra parliamentary struggle. Not only using portions of the state machine where those become available to us, but developing new organizations and institutions that can work on behalf of and for the people. And above all, the involvement of the great majority of the people in day-to-day -day mass struggle and the defeat of fundamentally reformist notions such as the one at present widely uh, promoted by the press and by some right-wing sectors, even of the Labour Party, that we must wait five years before beginning to attempt to defeat governments such as Maggie Thatcher's government today. No, it's essential, and this is a fundamental lesson of Chile, is the role of mass struggle on a day-to-day -day basis, outside Parliament, but not neglecting the possibilities such as they are that Parliament offers us. I must wind up now. So, what I want to do is just mention two things. First of all, the need of the Chilean people for solidarity. It's not only a need that they have. The need to give that solidarity is a need that we have and that our movement in Britain attaches enormous importance to and rightly. And one of the processes of learning the lesson what happened in Chile, is our own involvement in solidarity work with the people of Chile, because it affords precisely an opportunity for millions of working people in this country to learn about the experience of the revolution in Chile and to contribute positively to its future development 
and to our own protection. The best possible words that describe the achievement of the popular unity government were spoken by Salvador Allende moments before his death when the Moneda Palace, the government office in the center of Santiago was surrounded by tanks were firing on it and when the Hawker Hunter jets, the Chilean Air Force, were preparing to fire rockets into the palace to conclude the coup. And what he said was something of enormous significance. He said, the seeds that we have sown in the consciousness of thousands and thousands of Chilean men and women can never be eradicated. And that, in conclusion, is a lesson of every revolutionary process, that it raises consciousness in a way that can never entirely be destroyed. Comrade Chairman and Comrades, as the previous speaker said, it's obviously of vital importance that the movement in Britain and internationally draws all the lessons of the popular unity government and that period of struggle in Chile. That we are internationalists. We base ourselves not just on the history and the struggle of the working class in Britain, but we also have to absorb the lessons and including the defeats of the working class internationally. Now, the comrades who spoke first claimed that the Chilean Communist Party and the Communist Party in Britain and internationally have made criticisms of the strategy that was followed in Chile. Now, I think we have to fundamentally disagree with that. Not in the sense, of course, that they haven't made criticisms of various mistakes but the fact is that they claim that there were this or that mistake, but in essence, the strategy that they followed was still fundamentally correct, and that it's simply unfortunate, or the result of accidents, or the result of outside intervention that couldn't have been predicted, that the popular unity government was defeated and led to a, a catastrophic defeat as far as the Chilean workers' class was concerned, but also, of course, a blow to the working class movement internationally. Now the Comrade has put forward a number of gains, a very important gains, that the Chilean working class and the poor peasantry in Chile made during the Allende government. The land reform, for instance, which was in a period of a year much more than had been carried out in the six years of the previous Christian Democratic government. The gains that he mentions, as far as the wages and the conditions and the health uh, facilities of the workers are concerned. But the fact is that whatever gains that were made during the course of the popular unity government, they were unfortunately wiped out by the coup d'etat and by the vicious systematic repression that followed Pinochet's uh, seizure of power and the military rule that was imposed as a result. And I think that it's really in the realm of religious consolation to claim that they are permanent gains as far as the working class when nearly every one of those material gains was destroyed, had been destroyed in the last few years, when the organizations, the trade unions, the political parties of the workers have been shattered as far as Chile is concerned, and where unfortunately tens of thousands of working class people, both militant and people who weren't particularly involved in the struggle, have been murdered, died in the prisons of the Pinochet dictatorship. And we have to take that seriously and draw the lessons that will enable us to avoid such a defeat as far as Britain or as far as another country is concerned. Because as Mike Gatehouse said, that in the labor movement at the present time, the question is being posed. What if the policies contained, for instance, in Labour's 1973 program, put forward by the left wing of the National Executive of the Labour Party at the present time, what happens if a future Labour government attempted to implement those policies, which include policies for the nationalization of a number of big monopolies, of banks, and other reforms and measures which would cut into the power and the wealth of the ruling class in Britain. What would happen? 
And that's a vitally important question. That if we don't answer it satisfactorily, we have to say that we would face the danger of a similar defeat in Britain. Because let there be no mistake that if you read the commentaries of the Times, the Financial Times, the serious capitalist press in 1973, they themselves admitted that the same development could take place in France, in Italy, in Britain, if the labour movement moved in a, in a similar way against the position of power and wealth of the ruling class. That the army itself in Britain, the commanders of the army themselves made the comments, both in relation to Chile and in relation to the experience of Northern Ireland, that similar military methods would be used against the British working class if they took such fundamentally radical measures against the power of the ruling class in Britain. And therefore, it's not just an academic question. It's not just a question of what we owe in solidarity to the workers of Chile, but it's vital in the class interests of the workers in Britain and internationally that we draw the correct lessons from what happens in Chile, from the catastrophe that occurred in Chile, in our opinion, as the almost inevitable result of the mistakes of the popular government, of the very strategy that it was based on, of the very ideas, the so-called Marxism, that it was based on. Because I think we again have to differ with my case out there, that we can't in any way accept that the policies put forward by Allende, by the Communist Party in Chile, by the leaders <coughs> of the Socialist Party, in any way corresponded to the fundamental ideas of Marxism. That the tragedy came because precisely they ignored the fundamental ideas of Marxism. They ignored the lessons of past popular fronts where collaboration with the parties of the capitalist class or some of the parties of the capitalist class led the working class to defeat in Spain, in France, and in Chile itself in 1938, when there was a former popular front at that time which uh, the Communist Party and the Socialist Party participated in and which again led to a defeat. Not such a serious defeat at that time, but a defeat, for instance, that led to the banning of the Communist Party uh, uh, for a whole period in uh, Chile. And at any rate, the rank and file of the Socialist Party at that time, and probably many of the members of the CP, drew the lesson that it was a fundamental mistake. And unfortunately, that lesson that was learned in Chile itself was forgotten by Allende and the leaders of the Communist Party and the Socialist Party. The Socialist Party leaders, again, in 1970, succumbed to the pressure and the arguments of the Communist Party leadership and once again entered a popular front government. Because that's essentially what the United, uh, the popular unity government was in 1970. A popular front government where the inclusion of the radical party and some of the other smaller groupings in, the part, in, in this uh, popular unity government were, if you like, an excuse as far as they were concerned for not taking fundamental measures in relation to the state and the economy. And on the other hand, they were a safeguard and insurance as far as the capitalist class was concerned that they had a foothold in that government, that the radicals would act as a break on the government. And in fact, we found that uh, in the course of the popular unity government, the radicals did indeed split away from the government and attempted to precipitate a crisis as far as the popular unity government was concerned. Now, in 1973, the idea was put forward, both in Britain, among some on the left of the movement, as well as in Chile, that this was an entirely new experiment, that a new way had been found of uh, uh, bringing about a transformation uh, of society in a socialist uh, direction. And the formulas that were used were the ones that uh, Comrade Gatehouse put forward, of a, of a non-parliamentary uh, transition, of partial control of the state, if you like, of a, a transitional stage between a purely capitalist society and a socialist uh, society where there would be complete uh, socialist planning of the economy, complete nationalisation and work, uh, in fact a worker state to, uh, to run uh, society. That this would be a halfway house and the lefts in the Labour Party in Britain put forward the idea that this was the same as the idea of a rolling programme that was put forward in uh, the Labour Party here at that time. It would be step-by-step -step nationalisation, that it wouldn't go too far as to be uh, fundamentally antagonising big business or the ruling class, that it would go in accordance with what the working class as a whole thought was acceptable at that stage, and it would be the basis of a complete transformation of society by degrees at a future stage. And of course that it would be confined within the existing constitutional channels, and that would be the guarantee given the fact that the capitalist class has long accepted uh, constitutional means, parliamentary institutions in, uh, in Britain, that 
that, uh, that would be a way of ensuring that there was no violence, that there was no uh, armed struggle, that there was no bloodshed as far as the change of society was concerned. Well, I think uh, the comrades can, for themselves, see the irony of that argument in relation to Chile. But actually, exactly the same argument was made in relation to Chile, where it actually had much less substance than it uh, could possibly have in relation to uh, Britain, with a much stronger uh, capitalist class, with a much longer history of parliamentary institutions, and of course with a much stronger working class and labour movement than Chile, which, as uh, Comrade Gaita said, was still a dependent, semi-colonial country. But even in Chile, it was a completely false argument, because the Chilean capitalist class, the oligarchy, which consisted of the big landowners, the uh, big business uh, elements, and the financiers, was in fact one of the most reactionary and backwards ruling classes in Latin America. That although there had been parliamentary institutions for a long period of time, there was never a real completion of the task of a capitalist national democratic revolution, that the land reform hadn't been solved, that the development of Chilean capitalism had been based on the ruthless exploitation of the agricultural workers, and particularly the working class, and particularly the copper miners and the nitrate miners in Chile. And that if you examine Chilean history, you can find numerous examples of where the army, in the most brutal, in the most bloody way, intervened in order to suppress the movement of the working class, where thousands of trade unionists were shot or jailed or murdered in prison uh, 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 because of the struggle waged by the working class against the hor horrific semi-colonial or colonial conditions of the workers in, uh, in Chile throughout a long period of, uh, of, of history. And it was therefore an illusory argument to say that because there was parliamentary democracy, because Chile was sometimes referred to as the England of Latin America, that there could be no danger of an armed reaction as far as Chile was concerned when the workers moved to take over the, uh, the economy and to institute measures that were fundamentally against the interests of the capitalist class and in, in the interests of the working class and the other exploited sections of, uh, of capitalist society. Now, the argument again that was put forward and is still used in the pamphlets and the material of the Communist Party is, well, when the popular unity came to power, it had uh, no clear majority as far as the election was concerned. It had only, I think, 36% uh, of the uh, popular vote. They only had only 36%, and of course this wasn't sufficient. And therefore, partial measures had to be taken while there was time to win more, a bigger majority in subsequent elections, although the vote did go up for the popular unity uh, uh, coalition in the uh, following elections for the uh, Congress in April, where they got uh, slightly over 50% of the vote. But anyway, the argument was put forward that there must be time, there must be a very gradual process in order to uh, uh, not to alienate the middle class, to win over the middle class, and to consolidate an electoral uh, majority. Of course, the uh, Popular Front wasn't just uh, uh, a, a, a haphazard alliance, but it was based on the idea that this would be the strategy to win over the, uh, the middle class and the sections of the workers and peasants who were still under the, inter under the influence of the, uh, of the Christian Democrats. Now, it's an ABC question for Marxists that uh, we don't base ourselves on purely electoral calculations as far as attempts to win over either the working class or the middle class, or sections, backward sections of society who are under the influence of capitalist or reactionary uh, parties, or like the Christian Democrats, a capitalist party that for a period have been attempting to put on a more liberal or even a radical face in order to head off a movement to the left by sections of the middle class and the workers. The only way to win over the middle layers of society is by measures, by action, by implementing policies that actually benefit them in a material way, that show that the working class is prepared, is determined to bring about a fundamental change in society. The only thing that can result from delays and banking on the possibility of winning a bigger majority in the election in the future is that it fails to satisfy the working measures uh, of uh, one sort and another, probably aiding the right-wing uh, uh, homeland and liberty group, the neo-fascist or fascist uh, group, in order to bring about a disruption, to so-called destabilize the ANZ government, to provide the pretext at a later date for the army to move in. 
But that wasn't an accident. It wasn't like uh, bad weather that suddenly blew up in the face of uh, a ship that was charting a perfect course across the uh, oceans. It was the absolutely inevitable and predictable result of a movement of the working class to take over industry, to carry out a radical land reform, and to begin, it's true, begin to challenge the power of the, uh, of the capitalist uh, state. It was absolutely predictable that that would be the result. Now, what happened in the first period in Chile? The uh, government, when, it, uh, uh, when Allende didn't have a, a majority, he had to go to the Senate uh, in order, and the Congress in order to be voted in, because uh, that was uh, required under the Constitution. In order to get the vote, that he agreed on a pact with the Christian Democrats, where he agreed to a number of fundamental concessions in relation to the... Uh, the uh, Christian Democrats, who of course thinking of safeguarding the class interests of the ruling class in uh, Chile. They were that he, he should observe the uh, constitutional procedures as far as nationalization uh, measures were concerned, and that above all, that he wouldn't interfere in the armed services, that they wouldn't conduct propaganda, that he wouldn't interfere with the promotion and the appointments of officers, that it would be left entirely in the hands of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the existing uh, high command, general staff of the army, and that he wouldn't appoint anybody to positions in the army who hadn't been up through all the channels of the military academy, the staff college, and so on. In other words, that the key section of the state, and Engels pointed out that the state is ultimately armed bodies of men, that the key arm of the state, the real power of the state, would be decisively retained in the hands of the ruling class. And therefore the argument that it was possible for the working class to take portions of the state power is a completely false argument. Of course it's possible to undermine the power of some of the institutions of the state. It was possible to uh, force a, a retreat temporarily on the part of big business. And we'll see that that, uh, in fact, uh, came about on a massive scale in the first period of the popular unity government. But unless you tackle the problem of the army, of the armed bodies of men, of a decisive struggle to establish workers' uh, control and a workers' uh, democracy, as far as the country is concerned, then ultimately the army will be there to act in the interests of the, uh, of the ruling class, which is, of course, unfortunately, precisely what happened in the long run. Now, it's true that even in the first period of the popular unity government, even in spite of the caution of Allende and the uh, popular unity leaders, in spite of the constitutional agreement that was arrived at with the Christian Democrats, that Allende was probably pushed further than he expected, further than he intended, by the enormous mass pressure of the movements of the workers and the poor peasantry that was sparked off as a result of the victory of the popular unity in the election. And that's where the real power lies, that if the popular unity had based itself on the independent class interests of the working class and the other exploiting classes, if it had based itself on the movement of the working class and the other exploiting classes, then it could have carried through a transformation of society. But it carried out measures in their interest reluctantly, under pressure and all the time, trying to steer the movement into constitutional channels trying to limit the initiative and the independent movement of the workers, and particularly trying to curb and restrain the independent organs of workers' democracy that began to grow up in the course of the struggle in Chile. For instance, on the land, it's true that the Allende government carried out the most radical land reform in the history of Chile, probably one of the most radical ever carried out in Latin America, apart from uh, Mexico and uh, possibly uh, Peru, where it came about in a, in a different uh, way. But again, when the peasants and the agricultural laborers moved independently to seize the big estates, the Latifundia, and uh, even some of the middle-sized farms, that Allende himself called for them to restrain themselves, to do it according to the plan, according to the timetable, according to the legality of the land force that were established, and he authorized the army and the police and the uh, civil guards to be sent in to curb the, the movement of the peasantry, sometimes successfully, often uh, unsuccessfully, in that period of, uh, of, of struggle. And in that sense, that he began the process of undermining the confidence of the masses, the most exploited sections of society, in the determination of the, uh, of the popular unity government to bring about a fundamental change, to consolidate and sustain the gains that they felt they were beginning to make as far as the land reform was concerned. And the same applied in industry. 
that uh, Allende, of course, moved towards the nationalization of the copper, which even the Christian Democrats, by the way, at least a section of the Christian Democrats favored, that many other reactionary regimes or nationalist regimes in Latin America had taken over the oil, the nitrates, the copper, uh, 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 controlled by U.S. imperialism. And it was obviously uh, uh, an absolute prerequisite of any real advance that the copper be taken over. And, of course, there were other sections that ne were ne needed to be taken over. As Mike uh, Kedar says, that they did take over big firms. I think it was about 80 or 90 of the biggest firms probably accounting for 20% of uh, the industrial uh, sector of the economy in, uh, in, in Chile. And that's an enormous uh, blow to imperialism in itself and an enormous uh, gain for the workers. But the point is, will it be consolidated? Will it be extended into rounded out nationalization, central socialist planning of the economy, or will it be a halfway house that's only a tenuous step that can be undermined and taken away by a reaction? And again, when it came to the role of the workers, the workers themselves, after the initial uh, decisions of nationalization, themselves took the initiative and uh, uh, implemented uh, the nationalization. But in some, some industries, they demanded, they insisted on the nationalization of industry, even when it hadn't been uh, planned, or it hadn't been intended by the government. There were workers' councils, workers' committees, under various names that were set up in, the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in these uh, industries that some of them were partially given official recognition. But nevertheless, the Allende government and the CP played a leading role on this through, through the uh, Chilean uh, TUC, the CUT as far as uh, Chile is concerned, that they played a leading role, not in developing and extending and broadening these democratic bodies of the workers that began to grow up in the factories, but of actually curtailing them, of subjecting them to official control from above, from the ministries, according to the legality, according to the time scale, according to the methods of the government institutions of which they had uh, 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 ultimately, uh, uh, it's clear, a tenuous position at the top of the, of the old uh, state uh, machine, which they didn't completely control and which uh, they allowed to be counterposed to the independent movement, the democratic demands of the workers. Similarly, there were other organs of uh, what, what were known as popular power, but were in many ways the embryonic form of what could have become Soviet-type organizations, of neighborhood committees, of tenants committees, of uh, price control committees, and so on. An enormous uh, involvement of the masses, enormous energy, enormous enthusiasm, enormous initiative. But instead of basing themselves on this movement and initiative for the working class, again, the whole strategy of the uh, popular unity leadership was to restrain it. Now, that came to a head in a split within the popular unity government, there was this, uh, particularly within the Socialist Party, where the, much of the rank and file of the Socialist Party were clearly uh, alarmed and uh, seriously uh, feared that the policy of Allende would, uh, would, would be leading to uh, disaster because he wasn't prepared to carry through uh, a decisive uh, change in society. Particularly, of course, when with the lorry driver strike, uh, which were, and the lorry drivers were mainly uh, private uh, owner drivers, or they were, uh, uh, the strike was initiated anyway by the big business. It was used as a focal point for a capitalist uh, businessman's uh, strike, if you like, a reaction against the, uh, the public unity government. It wasn't a strike in the normal sense of the, uh, the word, although in the copper mines the uh, Christian Democrats actually initiated strikes of the uh, copper miners that were deliberately designed to undermine the, uh, the position of the, uh, of the government, but the reason they began to have an effect was because the Allende and the popular unity government didn't have sufficient control of the economy. There began to be inflation, there began to be shortages, which would, uh, could only have been overcome by rounded out socialist planning of the economy as a whole. And as the, the, the course of uh, 1972 went on, in the beginning of 1973 came, there began to be a serious uh, dislocation of the economy, which of course the, uh, uh, the capitalists uh, internationally want to blame on socialist measures, but were really because of partial and inadequate socialist measures to take uh, real control of the economy. And there was a split. In the, particularly in the Socialist Party. And there was enormous pressure, and uh, probably uh, within the uh, Communist Party as well, certainly within the trade unions, for more decisive socialist measures. And the policy that was put forward by the uh, leaders of the Communist Party and uh, Allende himself, and I think this can be checked from the material at the time and uh, the quotations that we've uh, put forward in various pu publications, argued for consolidation. They said that it was necessary to consolidate the reform that had already been passed and not to go too far. Because if they went too far, they would continue to alienate the middle class and they would provoke the military and 
the ruling class into a reaction, a bloody reaction against the uh, against the uh, popular unity, against the, the working class of Chile, is what it meant in uh, in, in, in practice. Well, as I've already tried to, to show, that the, even the initial measures of the popular unity government were quite enough to provoke a reaction. That the policy of the working class was to wait, was to allow some of the energy of the workers to be dissipated, to wait for confusion and demoralization and prepare for a reaction when they were in a slightly stronger position. And the, the policy adopted by uh, the popular unity government was uh, a, a fundamental, a dire mistake. Instead of at that stage of drawing the lessons of the experience so far and concluding that it was impossible to go forward to socialism on the basis of a halfway house of partial measures of limiting the movement of the workers and that it was now necessary to, uh, to put hand, uh, power directly in the hands of the, uh, the working class and take decisive measures against the reaction, that they drew the opposite conclu conclusion, that they had to consolidate, which uh, in fact meant to retreat and to pave the way for reaction. That was even worse than that. Party leaders internationally, not just to not conduct activity, propaganda, agitation, organization within the armed forces, but to uh, consciously resist conducting that agitation, and not only that, to, but to invite the generals, the admirals, the commanders of the air force into the cabinet in the hope that that would actually stave off a reaction was a complete and fundamental mistake. That no Marxist who understood the ideas of Marxism, who had any inkling of the past experience of revolutionary movement, could have any doubt as to what the outcome of that would be. That the military saw it, if you like, as a, as a temporary measure, again, to save themselves at time. But very shortly, in uh, June of uh, 1973, I think it was, there was the first serious attempted coup, the so-called mutiny, the coup, attempted coup of the tank regiment, where the uh, commanders of that regiment, again, jumping the gun a little bit, perhaps, attempted to stage a coup to undermine the popular unity uh, government. Now, the response of the workers shows that if the popular unity leaders, the Socialist Party leaders and the Communist Party leaders had taken decisive action and appealed to the working class and explained the role of the counter-revolution, of the oligarchy and the army, and explained the need to take complete control of the economy with uh, the uh, socialist family of the economy, and particularly to arm and prepare the workers to resist a reaction that was clearly being prepared with the army uh, and also the fascist groups that had begun to be uh, developed at that stage uh, to, to prepare to defend the gains of the workers against them, there could have been a reversal of the situation. Because without that leadership, in spite of the role played by the popular unity leaders, there was a massive uprising of the, uh, of the workers. The factories were seized, there was a general strike, there was a spontaneous move to, to form militias in order to defend the, the gains of the, uh, of the workers. And the whole period of the last three or four months of the uh, Allende government, there was one massive demonstration after another. And I think the comrades, I didn't see the film shown on Friday night, but they, sh they told me that it showed, for instance, the demonstration of about 800,000 uh, workers and supporters of the popular unity, uh, uh, I think a few days or even a day before the, uh, the, the coup d'etat which uh, overthrew it. But the fact is that the workers were tired of demonstrations, of meetings, of coming out on the street simply to express verbal support for the popular unity government because they wanted decisive action to uh, stop a, a counter-revolution that was clearly uh, preparing where there was, it was clear for all to see that that was uh, what the generals and the ruling class were about to, uh, to, to uh, launch and on the other hand to carry through the measures that the vast numbers of workers but particularly the active players of the workers in the unions and in the mass uh, political parties understood was needed for the working class to take power into its hands. And if they'd done that, it would have avoided the massive bloodshed. It could have avoided the massive bloodshed, the massive repression that came about as a result of uh, Pinochet's uh, coup d'etat. Because it seems to me rather ironic to say, well, we shouldn't advocate uh, decisive measures, we shouldn't uh, advocate uh, taking over the whole of industry, we shouldn't, uh, 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 we shouldn't advocate putting hands into organs of workers' power because it might provoke a reaction, it might lead to bloodshed, when the predictable result of the policy of the UP government was precisely a bloody reaction when the workers were mainly defenseless, that they were politically disarmed and they were uh, militarily disarmed. There's no real preparations have been made to uh, uh, defend the, uh, the workers uh, or, and organize against the, uh, the coup. And the, and the coup uh, took place uh, very rapidly without uh, uh, really uh, sustained uh, mass resistance, although
though, of course, uh, many workers gave their lives, died, in attempting to, uh, uh, to resist the, uh, the, the takeover. But unfortunately, at that stage, uh, there was very little that those workers uh, could do to, uh, to block the tanks, to block the, uh, the, the military, seizing complete uh, control of uh, society. And therefore, we have to draw the lessons. Now, in summing up, uh, Comrade Chairman, as I have very little time uh, left, I think we have to say that uh, those lessons, in fact, have not been learned by either the leaders of the Communist Party or the leaders of the Socialist Party in uh, exile, who are mainly exiled in uh, Russia or East Germany, and are uh, under the uh, political influence, if you like, of the leaders of the, uh, of, of the Communist Party. Although the lessons have certainly been discussed and uh, learned, and uh, there's a determination amongst activists in Chile at the present time not to repeat the mistakes. But the reason, the, 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 one, the only one uh, example that I give uh, for the leaders of the Communist Party not learning the lesson is that they still advocate a popular unity. And this time it's a popular unity that in the underground of Chile, after the role played by the Christian Democrats during the popular unity government, includes the Christian Democrats. That they believe that a struggle can be launched on behalf of the defense of the working class to restore trade union rights, to restore working class uh, rights and pave the way for a revival of the movement in Chile, which will certainly come in the future, which can be seen from the problems that the Junta is facing economically and socially at the present time, that that should be prepared on the basis of a new popular unity that would include the reactionaries of the Christian Democrats. Now, of course, sections of the middle class and the Christian Democrats have repented, if you like, of whereas before they welcomed the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the coup, the junta, because they thought, well, the junta, Pinochet and company will deal with the workers and then we'll be back in office. Now they're discontented because of the problems, because they're excluded from office by the military. But what possible confidence, what possible reliance can the working class place in the people that play such a treacherous role, such a reactionary role under the popular unity government. And therefore we have to draw the necessary lessons and prepare for a revival of the working class movement in Chile, for a renewed struggle for socialism on the basis of clear Marxist ideas, of a clear Marxist perspective, and on the independent movement and mobilization of the working class and the other oppressed classes of Chilean society. Of, of taking, taking over, over the, uh, the power, of uh, refusing to allow a counter-revolution, of being prepared when there was all the signs that the army chiefs and big business were preparing for a bloody counter-revolution, to be prepared to arm, to defend the workers, to guarantee a transformation of society, which could have been a peaceful transformation of society if the necessary mass support had been mobilized on the basis of a clear uh, Marxist uh, program. Now, as far as the uh, Allende was concerned, the, uh, he uh, adopted the position uh, of the agreement with the Christian Democrats has been mentioned, but even in 1973, he was still agreeing to measures against uh, some of the sections on the left who had arms, or were accused of having arms by the military, and saying that they must be against extremism on both sides. In other words, they must curb the fascists, but in order to uphold legality, they must also curb what he called the uh, ultra-left. And no doubt there were certain ultra-left uh, escapades or ultra-left uh, uh, developments as far as some of the small groups on the fringes of the labor movement were concerned. But that was really an excuse to avoid the question of whether he was prepared, whether the government was prepared to actually arm the workers and mobilize the workers in defense of uh, the working class against the danger of a counter-revolution. Now, one of the incidents or incidents that began to happen just before the coup was the use of the so-called arms control regulations, which were agreed to by uh, Allende, by the commanders of the army, to carry out purges amongst the working class in the district, but also within the navy, where they accused a number of uh, sailors who had uh, publicly come out and <coughs> warned the workers of preparations for a coup, where these sailors were arrested and tortured, and measures were taken, in other words, to curb the opposition that had developed within the navy, which was a clear sign that there was a possibility of the workers actually winning over the rank and file of the services, the navy, the army and so on, if they'd have adopted a bold uh, position. And it's not a question of long years of preparation. But that, of course, uh, should be conducted. But even without preparation, as the case of the Russian Revolution showed, that where the, work, where the Bolsheviks took a bold position, that they showed the rank and file of the army and the navy that they were determined to take over, that they were determined
determined to be the winning side, and there was no question of simply a, uh, a half-hearted appeal or saying, please don't uh, shoot the workers, but of showing them that it was a question of who controls society, of who will hold the power, whether it will be the counter-revolution or the working class with revolutionary methods. Then they won over, they cracked the army, they cracked the navy, and they brought over the large numbers of the rank and file to their side in the, uh, in, in, in the revolution, which of course was decisive as far as the carrying through of a change of society uh, was uh, concerned. But it, it's simply not true that the Communist Party has learned the, uh, the lessons of these uh, developments, either in Chile or elsewhere, because in other countries, in Italy, in uh, Britain for that matter, the policy is still put forward of uh, strictly adhering to the constitutional uh, norms, the constitutional arrangements, as far as the army and the navy are concerned. And one uh, prime example of that was in Portugal, where even though the armed forces movement had developed on the basis of the young officers, and some of them had moved towards the idea themselves of a socialist change in society, that nevertheless in Portugal in 1974, 75, the Communist Party refused to come out in favour of the democratisation of, uh, of the armed forces. And it actually opposed the formation of workers' councils or, or soldiers' and, and sailors' councils within the uh, armed forces on the ground that they should be left in the hands of the, uh, the commanders and that the officers, the armed forces movement, was a democratic, progressive movement and they should be left to, to carry out the necessary changes as far as not just the army was concerned, but as far as society was concerned. And the Communist Party was prepared to tail any armed forces movement, which of course paved the way when there was a swing of the general situation in Portugal for Irish and the right wing in the, uh, the army to consolidate their position once again and to use the, or potentially use anyway, the army as a force of reaction in Portugal in the, uh, in, in the future. And again, as uh, Ted uh, Grant mentioned, that in the case of Italy, the Berlin Woods uh, treaties on the lessons of Chile show that he's learned absolutely none of the lessons of Chile, where they advocate exactly the same uh, bloc or alliance with the, uh, the Christian Democrats in Italy that uh, was being advocated in Chile, is being advocated in Chile now, following the, uh, the coup and the defeat of the popular unity uh, the government. Now, as another comrade said, we're not in, 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 uh, opposed to uh, 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 an agreement to uh, uh, joint action with uh, other working class parties or even other capitalist parties. That in uh, Russia, the Bolsheviks before the revolution had uh, at various times on particular issues when it was in the interest of the workers, a joint agreement on this or that issue, that they agreed to join to action. It would be crazy for a workers' party not to adopt that uh, position, to, to refuse all compromise, all joint action on the principle. But it has to be on the basis of an independent organisation and an independent policy on the part of the workers. And as the comrade uh, that spoke on that said, that it's absolutely out of the question that we could have, that we would advocate or that the Workers' Party should adopt a programmatic alliance with uh, a bourgeois party, and uh, particularly uh, a programmatic uh, uh, alliance which would inevitably limit the struggle of the working class, or attempt to limit the struggle of the working class, that, that uh, would be a barrier, a built-in barrier, to the achievement of, uh, of socialism. As it was in Chile, where the constitutional guarantees, the limitation of the program, were deliberately designed in order to, uh, to, to block the way, to, to impede the way, towards the socialist change in uh, society. Now another comrade mentioned the uh, fact that the CP now blame the defeat uh, on the fact that the CP was, or the working class, was isolated, that it didn't have their allies. Well, I would, uh, I think the comrade, I don't uh, entirely agree with what he said in passing, that uh, we should welcome the working class uh, being isolated. That's not the point, that we should conduct a policy uh, precisely of the working class attempting to win over and gain their decisive influence over other sections of the population, including the middle class, and even attempting to split the, uh, the upper layers of the, uh, of the middle class. There's no question about that. But the fact is, as was pointed out in the discussion, that that did begin to happen in Chile, not on the basis of the constitutional arrangements of the government or the program of the government, but on the action of the working class. And there were actually splits in the Christian Democrats, for instance, the so-called uh, Christian left, the IEC, split away from the, uh, the Christian Democrats, the MAPU, which was in the popular unity, which was originally a breakaway from the Christian uh, Democrats, also split, and uh, a section of them came out in favour of the left wing of the Socialist Party, opposing the retreat of uh, Allende and so on. And uh, there were many other signs of the fact that there was the possibility of winning over sections of the middle class and uh, of, of breaking the influence of the, uh, the Christian democratic leadership over the sections of the middle class, the peasantry, and even some sections of the workers that they controlled. But of course, it could only be done by decisive 
for class action and not by appeals to uh, constitutionality, when, uh, especially when the economy was uh, moving into uh, a crisis, there was disruption, and uh, particularly when the counter-revolution was uh, preparing. Now again, as comrades have said, that we don't uh, question the sincerity of the end day. It's not a question of, uh, uh, of accusing him of conscious uh, betrayal, of not leading the working class uh, to success through uh, bad motives or lack of willpower, that he undoubtedly sacrificed uh, his life, as many uh, thousands of other workers and members of the parties, uh, the workers' parties uh, did. But it's a question of seeing that those policies are completely mistaken, that they can never be successful as far as the achievement of socialism is concerned. And I think that's reinforced by the present policy as far as Chile is concerned. Well, as has been mentioned, the, the Communist Party has adopted the position of a uh, united front with the uh, uh, popular front, rather, or a, a new form of the popular unity with uh, the Christian Democrats in, uh, in, in, in Chile. And that's after, by the way, in the first instance, <coughs> of calling for armed resistance after they refused to arm the workers during the time of the popular unity government that they called for armed resistance afterwards when, of course, there was a catastrophic blow to the working class and it was necessary for any uh, party or any uh, uh, leadership to uh, base itself on a recovery of the working class, a consolidation of the working class in order to recover from the wounds of the, uh, of, of the coup d'etat. But uh, again, as has been mentioned, there's no uh, question of uh, the regime in, uh, in Chile are lasting for an indefinite period, that it's not a fascist regime, in that it didn't have a mass basis amongst the petty bourgeois and the, uh, uh, the backward layers of the, uh, of the peasantry, like the classical fascist regimes did. It's true that it used many of the methods of fascism, the barbaric uh, torture, the barbaric uh, repression and so on, but as far as its social basis is concerned, it's extremely limited. And that's why we see now that the Christian Democrats, the middle class, even within the coup itself, have been split in, in the military itself, have been split to reflect the crisis within uh, Chilean society. The fact that Pinochet has found no way out as far as Chilean capitalism is uh, concerned. And that will open the way to splits within the, uh, in the, uh, the junta, but of course particularly to the revival and the renewal of a struggle on the, on, on the parts of the, uh, the working class in Chile. And it's vital that all the, uh, the lessons are drawn and that the disastrous mistakes of the past are not repeated. And finally, Comrade Chairman, I think that it's again being mentioned in this discussion, but in my experience in the recent period, in discussions in the Labour Party and the trade unions on the issue of what programme should Labour adopt in Britain, that it nearly always comes up in the discussion of what about Chile, what happened in Chile. Wouldn't the programme now advocated by the left in the NEC of the Labour Party result in a similar situation? And we have to say that as far as the ruling class of Britain is concerned, as far as the military commanders in Britain is concerned, yes, exactly the same would happen if they were able to get away with it. But of course the safeguard against that is the mobilisation of the working class around a clear Marxist programme and a clear Marxist leadership capable of ensuring a successful socialist transformation of society in Britain and of course looking uh, on the wider horizon to the international transformation of society throughout the world. I doubt if I have made very many converts here this afternoon. Um, something that I didn't really mention in my opening was the question of the role in Chile, and in particular during the popular unity, of the ultra-left. The Chilean Communist Party has been extremely severe in its criticism of the role of the ultra-left. In fact, it published an amazing polemical document called The Ultra-Left Imperialism's Wooden Horse of Troy. The wooden horse that was thrust within the walls of the popular unity uh, experiment. I don't necessarily want to endorse so severe a judgment, but I do want to pick out particular elements of the criticism that the Chilean communists make of what they call leftist deviations within popular unity. And when they make that analysis, they don't in fact confine uh, those deviations to any particular political group. They simply state that they were present within popular unity as a whole. The first was the failure to understand the nature of alliance 
which had made possible the popular unity government and the beginning of the application of the popular unity program. And with that, the failure to understand who was the principal enemy against whom the efforts of the working class must be directed if its work was to succeed. <coughs> the principal enemy was quite clearly defined as being finance capital and those sectors of the land-owning bourgeoisie and the monopoly bourgeoisie allied with imperialism. I didn't say they were the only enemy. Those were the principal enemy. And those were the enemies that popular unity was going to confront. One of the major problems, and it is still a problem today, is those who would say that the Christian Democrat Party, or individual Christian Democrats, or many Christian <coughs> Democrats, are part of the principal enemy. Equally difficult is the situation of the refusal to analyse the class basis of the different political groupings in Chile, and in particular the class basis of the Christian Democrat Party. There is no doubt that approximately 25% of the Chilean working class voted for Christian Democrat candidates in congressional elections and in trade union elections and that the Christian Democrat Party was a genuinely, and still is, a mass party that commands substantial allegiance within <coughs> as well as outside the working class. It also, of course, includes very substantial middle sectors and some sections of the bourgeoisie, basically the most modern, the sectors of the most modern capital. Some of them allied with imperialism, others perhaps not. <coughs> The third particular element that, in, that the Chilean communists single out for criticism is those who, from out of idealist notions, condemned, for instance, key elements of popular unity's programs, such as the battle for production. People who, from a petty bourgeois standpoint, try to pretend that the basic question of economic production and survival was in some sense a sort of luxury imposed by reactionaries rather than a fundamental question to which the working class of every country has to address. Those three points then were criticism. <coughs> the army, many comrades have referred in their address to the role of the army. First of all, the arms control law. There is no question whatsoever but that the law that was passed for the control of arms operated effectively to enable the most reactionary sectors of the military to act alone with the, in alliance with the most reactionary judges in order to attack the working class and in order to accustom the raw recruits in the armed forces to being used in military action against the working class. That is true. What is not true is that popular unity in any way wished to see that law passed. Uh, and what does in fact appear to be the case <coughs> is that it was a mistake that it was not vetoed by the President. A procedural mistake at the time. And you can all laugh, but the fact of the matter is that between approximately October, November 1972, when that law was passed, and approximately April, May 1973, when it began to be applied, nobody pointed out the dangers. And in fact, the dangers were not widely understood at the time in Chile. The question of a military cabinet. The Chilean Communist Party has stated very clearly that it believes one of the most important mistakes made by popular unity was the ejection from the cabinet after the March 1973 elections of General Prats and the other military officers for the very simple reason that their inclusion in the cabinet had made it possible to ally some of the democratic <coughs> sectors of the armed forces 
with the popular movement and to involve them in its program. And that when they were then thrust out, it isolated those sectors and this led to the resignation of General Kratz, the complete isolation within the armed forces of the constitutionalists and paved the way directly for the coup d'etat. The question of alliances has been much referred to. The, the Chilean Communist Party, and indeed the whole of popular unity, were clear about one thing. The working class in Chile on its own could not take power, nor could it hold power. <coughs> other conditions might exist in other countries, but by itself, the working class in Chile was not sufficiently strong to take and occupy power. It needed to surround itself with allies. The process of building such an alliance went on, obviously, throughout the history of this century, but in particular from the early 50s until 1970. And the logical victory of the beginnings of the construction of an adequate alliance was the electoral victory that brought President Allende to power in 1970. Quite clearly, that alliance was not sufficient to carry out and to carry through a full program such as the Popular Unity Program, let alone the ultimate transformation to socialism. And that could only take place if in the course of carrying through the Popular Unity Program, the alliance was strengthened and broadened. And many speakers here this afternoon who thoroughly disagree with what I say have nevertheless agreed with that point and have understood the importance of it. Something that comrades have tended to overlook is the fact that up until March 1973 and reflected in the election results then, in fact the alliance was growing, was broadening, popular unity was attracting more support and it was attracting support especially from sectors of the working class who were less well organized or less conscious or previously had voted for Christian Democrats and it was attracting support from middle sectors who had wavered in 1970. The position today in Chile is one where, again, the Communist Party says very clearly, the principal enemy is the fascist military junta and those imperialist powers that sustain it in power. The principal task for Chilean revolutionaries is to get rid of that junta. And any alliance that makes that possible is an alliance that is worth forging for the fundamental and basic necessity that confronts the Chilean working class, the Chilean people, and Chilean revolutionaries. If they are to go forward, they have no choice but to get rid of the junta by every means at their disposal. And any alliance that makes that possible is for that purpose and for the duration of that purpose an alliance that is worthwhile forging. And they are very clear about that. I'd like, finally, simply to make a very simple appeal, and that is the following. It is very probable that within the coming weeks, if indeed they have not already done so, the Conservative government here will renew armed supply to Chile. In my view, that is by far the most important form of assistance because of its wider implications that British <coughs> reactionaries can give to General Pinochet in Chile. In my view also, by far the most important task solidarity movement in Britain is to do everything in its power to ensure that those arms never leave this country and do not reach the Junta in Chile. I think that is far the greatest contribution <coughs> that we and our labour movement could make to the future of the revolution in Chile. And I hope that everyone here will engage in that.